Well, thank you folks for, for being so patient. Um, again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, throw a few emojis in there. That's my special request for everybody today um, that describe yourself. Help us all feel like we're, you know, sharing this, this spiritual space with um, some fellow human beings. Um, yeah, and let's get started. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Rohan Menon. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am a learning experience designer at an educational design lab called Redesign. Um, and I am joined today by a couple of uh, really wonderful students who you're going to hear from in just a second. Um, but since I asked y'all for some emojis, I feel like, I, you know, I got to share my own. It's only fair. Um, so I've got a four up here just real quick to give you you all again a sense of where, who I am as a human being, as a whole person that's that's coming, coming here and talking to y'all today. Um, so I got a soccer ball. I'm a big soccer fanatic. I've played throughout my life and I'm kind of moving into a, a coaching role as I've, as I've gotten older, which is a real joy. Um, I've got a black cat at home named Bast. Um, the brain emoji is for my background in neuroscience that influences a lot of the ways that I show up in the field of education and the work that I get to do now. Um, and the six-pointed star, if any of y'all out there are, are flag nerds, the way that I am, you might recognize it from the city flag of Chicago, which is my, my beautiful home city. Um, so that's a little about me. Um, again, as we're going, please, you know, if you're, you're just popping in, please feel free to introduce yourself similarly in the chat. Um, we, we love to, to get to see who is joining us today. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to my student co-presenters so they can introduce themselves and, uh, more importantly, talk about their emojis. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Annika. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a freshman at the University of Rochester studying cognitive science. And there's no real meaning behind my emojis. I just kind of chose the ones that best captured my essence. Hello. My name is. Daniel Nalder, uh, Purple Heart, and I love laughing with friends, family, and everybody. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Sabi. Um, I am a senior uh, at Walter Panis High School in Lakeland, New York. Um, I am also the student rep on our Equity for All Committee, which is how I got connected with Redesign. Um, kind of similar to Annika, I went about choosing my emojis a little bit willy-nilly. Rohan definitely put some more thought um, into his, but um, I will highlight my, my ink pen. Um, I've been a, a big poetry, um, Emily Dickinson, Elizabeth Bissip enthusiast for a very long time. Um, so yeah, it's lovely to spend some time with y'all. Awesome. Um, thanks, folks. Um, yeah, so let's let's get into it. I want to start um, start the session getting everyone a little warmed up, a little loose. We're going to have some fun with Zoom. Um, so I'm going to ask that we start this, this little warm-up section with our cameras off. Um, so it looks like most of y'all, hopefully you're not busy online shopping right now, but most of y'all already got the, got the memo beforehand. Um, but yeah, let's start with our, our cameras off. Um, and, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to go to gallery view if you can, or at least try to get a view with that lets you see a few other people. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to throw out a question. We're going to do a little, a little visual poll. So if you agree with the, the, the question or the statement, um, I want you to turn your camera on. That's how you're going to respond to the poll. And if you don't agree or you answer no, let's keep your camera off. And so what's going to happen is everyone with their cameras is going to burst into existence, get to see each other maybe give each other a smile, a little wave. Um, and we're going to get this cool little visual of, of people popping in and out based on how they answer the questions. That sound good. So again, gallery view is going to be the coolest way to do this. Um, if, if you can, if you're on a phone or something like that, totally, totally okay. If you, if you can't, um, but yeah, let's get started. I'm seeing everyone. Oh, look at y'all all cameras off. I feel so alone all of a sudden. Um, let's get into the first question so we can fix that. Uh, so first question, have you ever thought about, how to create more flexibility in your student's school day. Uh, remember, if you answer yes, let's turn our cameras on. Give our oh, look at all those be beautiful people. All right, fantastic. Give everyone a little wave, look at this. These are, these are your fellow yes, yes folks. Oh, I love it. That was so synchronized too. Very cool, very cool. Um, awesome. So let's go cameras off again. We're gonna do next question. 
Uh, next question is, have you ever thought about how to give your students a more active role in their learning? Let's pop back in. Oh, so cool. Yeah, give a little wave, give a little smile, do a little dance if you're feeling it. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Maybe a little, maybe a little uh, too close to lunchtime for people to be dancing, but understandable. Um, okay, we'll go cameras off for our third question. Um, have you ever thought about different ways to assess student learning? Um, you know, aside from kind of big traditional final exams. Let's pop in here. Yeah, look at that. We almost got everybody. Very cool, very cool. Um, look at you, I bet some of y'all are changing your answers because you're feeling FOMO now. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's okay. That's okay, it's, it's, uh, that's allowed. Um, cool, let's go cameras off for our fourth, and this is our final question. This is kind of the big question that, um, you know, the rest of this presentation is gonna kind of, kind of focus around is, how many of y'all think your students, the students that you work with should be a part of your work to change these classroom paradigms? Let's see, let's see our yeses, let's see our noes. Oh, look at that, everybody. Yeah, awesome, look at that. We got almost 100%, that's fantastic, fantastic. Um, that's exactly what I was hoping to see, and I think our students were hoping to see as well, because for the remainder of this hour, what you're gonna hear from us is, uh, yeah, why your answer to that last question should be an emphatic yes, um, and how you can turn that into a superpower for your own learning community. Um, so uh, first, I just want to cover a little bit about who we are. I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I am uh, a curriculum designer that works at Redesign. Um, so Redesign, we are an education design lab, and we're kind of um, our commitment is to developing meaningful, positive, and uh, really joyful learning for all young people. So you know, we help build and support inclusive learning communities, and really, our vision is is that education becomes a pathway to to liberation. Um, and so as part of this work, you know, we're regularly involved in rethinking, reimagining, uh, redesigning, hence the name, um, educational paradigms, like the ones we, we just uh, talked to you all about in these questions. Um, and our goal is, is to do that so that schools can become what we call uh, learner-centered communities. These are places where all young people can thrive. And uh, we think that students, young people, ought to be a part of making those communities, be a part of that work. Um, and so that's why we started a youth advisory council which is where um, my, my student co-presenters are, are joining us from. Uh, this is a group of students that is from all over the country, different academic, social, cultural, um, and other identities who are uh, you know, kind enough to share with us the, the most valuable thing that they have, uh, which is not actually their advice on how to make viral TikToks, although uh, I've definitely asked a couple of students about that. Um, it is their perspectives as students on how to make school better, you know, their, their lived experience, getting to see schools day to day, um, and really, and really uh, noticing what's working, what's not, and of course, how to, how to improve things. Um, so as I said, we're very lucky to have a couple members of our Youth Advisory Council here today, um, Sabi, Annika, and Donnell. Um, and they are gonna be sharing with you some of the exciting work that they've been doing, um, as well as a little bit of their own perspectives on why y'all should think of your students, you know, not only as resources that you can draw on, um, but partners that, you should work with as you explore these paradigms and, and possibilities. Um, and so our session today is gonna have two parts, each one focusing kind of on a different way that we are trying to create a collaborative model for the future of learning that really centers student perspectives. Um, so in part one, our students are gonna describe these investigations that they've been doing um, into the broken, outdated, and really inequitable educational paradigms that um, they have confronted directly in their own school communities. Um, and the solutions that they found through their, through their investigations. Um, and then in part two, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Redesign's approach to involving students in our own process of reimagining specific educational paradigms as a design lab. Um, and yeah, that, that will be our time. We'll, we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. But of course, if you have questions for myself um, or more importantly for, for our students, um, feel free to, to pop them in the chat as, oh, as we go. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to keep taking a look at the chat, um, but in case I miss it, um, you know, please, uh, please be patient. Um, great, so um, let's get started with, with part one, um, which of course is all about our students and the work that they, they have been doing. Um, so, you know, to, to kick this section off, I would love to ask our students a question, let them kind of, kind of share a little bit. Um, so folks, y'all have heard me describe our Youth Advisory Council, it's all these folks. 
Um, how would you describe it yourselves? You are the ones who are kind of um, participating in it and, and who make it up. How would you describe the Youth Advisory Council? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so whenever like friends and family ask me about art redesign and Yak and what I do, I think my go-to explanation is just a focus group for education, right? So redesign is basically getting feedback on their ideas from their target audience, which is students. I also think Yak is just a really good opportunity for students interested in education to kind of get their foot in the door and see what that industry is like. It's also, I think, most importantly, a way for students interested in education to connect and talk to other students who share a similar passion and interest, which for me personally has been very fun, just a great overall learning experience. Mm -hmm. Very cool, thank you, thank you, Annika. Um, and then can one of y'all talk a little bit um, maybe about this project that we are, you know, calling Paradigms and Possibilities, that's kind of the focus of our, of our session today. Um, you know, what was the goal of this kind of investigative project? What were you trying to do? Um, yeah, can you share a little bit about that for the folks in, in the audience who don't really know what we're talking about yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Paradigms and Possibilities uh, is very aptly named. Um, so what we, uh, as, as a group of, of students, as a, as a focus group, um, like Annika just said did, was, was choose a paradigm, um, something that commonly occurs in a lot of schools across the US. Um, uh, we, we, we really dove into it. So we, we took a look at what was working and mostly what wasn't working. Um, and, and then we did some research. So we kind of set out to see how other folks were problem solving across the US, what districts that were taking more creative approaches to things like um, the traditional final or how students uh, are involved in the, in the curriculum design process or even something like the rigid, you know, eight period a day uh, schedule. Uh, were being addressed um, in schools that wanted something a little bit different. Um, and, and we kind of selected uh, our own favorite competency-based approach or something that we found more holistic, more applicable. Um, we relied on our own educational experience as students. We interviewed peers, we interviewed mentors. Um, and it was just a really excellent way to become more acquainted with how education looks around the US and kind of beyond the realms of our own insular communities. Um, and so we took a paradigm and, and we found its possibility. We found what we could do with it. Um, and, and the culmination of our research was uh, as presenting the, the solutions that uh, others had established across the US and stuff that maybe we ourselves had devised that we thought uh, would be most applicable. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks, Abby. Um, very cool. I think, uh, I think I appreciate that the, the name of the project seemed apt. That's, that's good. Um, yeah, and so I think this would be great now to, you know, folks who've kind of heard uh, what you're doing as part of this, this Youth Advisory Council, right, and a little bit about this project that, that we keep talking about. Um, so let's get into it. I, I think, would you all be uh, open to kind of sharing for a few minutes um, about the paradigm that you explored, why you chose it, um, what you found, obviously, through the investigation, as, as Savi described, um, and then really, how can we think about this differently? Like, what are the solutions? What what do folks need to hear from students about how we, we can uh, solve these these paradigms. Annika, you want to maybe go first? Yeah, yeah sounds good. Uh, so the paradigm that I chose is flexible scheduling in schools. Um, and so the reason why I chose this specific topic is because I personally moved from a more traditional public school with more rigid scheduling to a more flexible alternative school called Acton. It was really based around the idea of giving students as much flexibility in their scheduling as possible. So I wanted to use this project basically as a way to kind of dive into the research and more technical aspects of my own personal experience. So overall, I kind of came away with four big conclusions that I want to share with you guys. Two main challenges that I think we're going to have to overcome if we want to effectively implement flexible scheduling and two main benefits that I think flexible scheduling provides students. So first, I think the big, one of the big negatives of flexible scheduling is that it inherently requires longer term deadlines, which basically just makes it a lot easier for students to fall behind to the point where it's almost impossible for them to catch up. Um, a simple solution that I found to this problem is just having students set their own short term deadlines and short term milestones, which allows for flexibility, but while also retaining some form of accountability. However, research and studies that have implemented this have found some problems. Um, and I think that 
figuring out how to keep accountability while also increasing flexibility is something we're gonna have to think more deeply about. The second big negative or challenge is just a logistical issue. Most of the schools across the US that I found that effectively implemented flexible scheduling were a lot smaller and just did it on a much smaller scale. Um, most programs to kind of scale that up didn't work as well. And I think that we're gonna have to be creative in how we figure out that those logistics. Um, moving on to the positives, I think the first positive of flexible scheduling is that education occurs not just in a classroom, right? The extracurricular opportunities the students are a part of are a crucial part of developing you know, well-rounded holistic students. I think flexible scheduling just allows for more meaningful extracurricular opportunities, whether that's holding a job, getting an internship, traveling, spending time with your family, playing sports, just all the things that allow students to become overall more well-developed. And then finally, and I think most importantly, flexible scheduling gives students autonomy over their own learning. And it's been shown like both in the education industry and out of it, that when you give people more control over what they're doing in their lives, they're just generally more satisfied with it and more invested in what they're doing, which I think is the most important thing we can do to improve educational outcomes across the board. So overall, I'm a big fan and big proponent of flexible scheduling. I think there are a lot of challenges and problems that we're going to need to overcome to implement it effectively. But I think if we do, the benefits are going to be pretty great. Awesome. Thank you, Annika. Um, if folks didn't get a, get a chance to see, I put a link in the chat to Annika's Paradigms and Possibilities Project. Um, we have kind of a, a document. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, uh, responding to some folks in the chat. Um, yeah, so folks who answered yes to our question about flexible scheduling, a document is, uh, well, it's for everyone, but especially for y'all. Um, so please take a look. Um, there's a lot of, you know, really, really awesome um, information in there. Some really great resources. Annika did a, did a really incredible job compiling, um, you know, and synthesizing, I think, a, a lot of ideas from the field about this. Um, cool. Uh, maybe we can move on. Donnell, do you want to go next? Tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah, sure. So awesome. for my project, I chose the paradigm of passive versus active learning or the level of student engagement in their learning. And I chose to do this because I know that not all student, students learn the best in traditional ways like notes and lectures, exams or worksheets. And they might learn better in untraditional ways like labs or hands-on experience. Uh, my learning has been an example of this as, as I've always enjoyed non-traditional learning and hands-on learning. Uh, for example, this year I'm taking a zoology class and I really love it, not just because I'm a science nerd, but also because we get to take re regular field trips. We get to see the animals we're learning about and we get to learn with our hands. Like when we're memorizing skulls, we get to actually touch and feel the skulls and see them up close instead of actually, instead of just like seeing a picture of them. Um, and Sorry, <laughs> uh, I've seen that students, when students are actively learning, they are more engaged and um, I found one major thing that really helps improve the level of motivation and that is giving students choice over their learning. That over the task um, or even choice of what objectives they're trying to reach uh, through the activity. Um, in my research, I found one example of a math teacher who gave her students the choice to choose the context of the warm up problem of the day. And she found that her students were more engaged, more motivated, they performed better on the warm up problem, and they were even tardy less often which um, because they were more motivated to be in class. On the other hand, there was a different math teacher who gave her students a range of problems or a, a different sets of problems ranging in difficulty, but she found that her students tended to choose the easier ones 
And then they would get them done, become bored and lose motivation because they weren't becoming challenged. Um, so I found through these two, two examples that some things can really um, improve students' motivation, but some things can't. It really depends on a couple things like how well the students understand the choice, um, the relative size of the choice, and um, also peer pressure. Um, I learned that the um, that the that we need to figure out what choices to give students that will help them be, become more motivated in their um, in their learning, but also know which things need to be monitored by teachers so the students are still being challenged and still learning. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity. I got to explore this paradigm and um, I've realized that I, how the difference between how motivated I am in a classroom setting where there's active learning taking place um, compared to in a classroom setting where there's not. And um, I look forward to future opportunities to um, actively learn and make choices in my education. Right on, thanks, Danielle. Um, and again, folks, if you answered yes to our, our question earlier, you're interested in, um, you know, active learning, um, hands-on, hands-on learning as Donnell described, um, check out the, the document that I just shared in the chat. Again, this one's to Donnell's Paradise of Possibilities Project. Um, cool. Um, Sabi, do you want to you wanna bring us on? Tell us about your, your project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just hearing Danelle and Annika speak reminds me again how cool my peers are, which I think is just one of the most amazing things about YAC is what I find interesting and what I find most applicable in my schooling isn't necessarily what everybody else does, but the way that they speak and their interest and what they find is always so intriguing to me. So um, I think that's one of the great the great parts about being in a room full of people who are actually excited about education and, and what education philosophy looks like. Um, so speaking of education philosophy, that kind of brings me to my PMP project. Uh, so I focused on the relevance and the effectiveness of the traditional final, you know, dreaded by the student body, 20% of the final exam grade, mostly multiple choice. Um, so the traditional final isn't great at assessing what it's supposed to, which is content knowledge, right? There's a whole bunch of different confounding factors, whether that's test anxiety or that's literacy ability when it comes to non ELA examinations. So the ability to read a word problem very quickly and fulfill a math exam um, when, it, when it's testing problem solving and not necessarily reading speed, um, which disproportionately affects students of different ethnicities, genders, um, racial backgrounds, etc. Um, and in addition, you know, the traditional final isn't great at testing what's more important and what we know to be more important, which is student ability, you know, things like critical thinking, communication, collaboration, um, problem solving, again. Um, so Things that you know can't be so easily determined if, if I answer yes or no to a multiple choice question. Um, so what I was really interested in seeing is how schools that really wanted to measure their students' ability sets and how prepared their students were for the workforce uh, were, were measuring were measuring growth across the U.S. And the good news is that there is a range of creative options out there um, that I that I was very enthused about. Um, most most districts kind of approach this through a project standpoint. Uh, most districts are, are looking for some kind of uh, community involvement effort. Um, there's a lot of culmination. The, I know the IB um, program can be tied into this, but doesn't have to be. Um, but, but ultimately, the application of school content in the real world was kind of the, the one deciding factor that tied districts all over the US from different states together. Um, and most are assessed through a variety of different rubrics that are developed primarily to promote kind of student self assessment of, of skill sets, which is something that's incredibly important in the workforce right and um, I'm kind of going through the college application process now and as I always get that question, you know, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses and I'm like, ugh, if I had a competency based rubric, maybe I would know. Um, so, so I, these rubrics kind of just serve to focus educators on, on how their students are applying the skills that they've accrued over the year, um, rather than how they're internalizing content. Um, so for me, this PMP kind of opens up a larger conversation, um, just about the competency-based approach in general, and, and how re-examining paradigms tying to something that has kind of been the big conversation in my district over the last three years, and I'm assuming um, in some of y'all's as well, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right, so competency-based education, we know it's, it's an older philosophy. It's been around in, in education and its relation to students since the 70s. Kind of has an established set of philosophies, principles, 
um, and, and we know what it is. Uh, DEI, in contrast, um, at least in the education fields and my district, which is very far behind um, a lot of the US, has really only been um, a serious conversation uh, and, and using that terminology within the last three years. Um, and kind of, you know, nationally, it's only risen to kind of public consciousness within the last decade. So a lot of folks can agree, you know, DEI is incredibly important. Um, we, we want to approach it. But that question of tangible implementation, that question of how is where a lot of places, my own district included, get very caught up. Uh, so CBE is an incredibly valuable tool um, in, in implementing DEI. Um, and, and I want to start with what we were kind of just talking about, um, right, like reevaluating that traditional final. Um, so it actually addresses uh, DEI to kind of step away from that, that traditionally weighted metric um, because students have different backgrounds, right? And the availability is, you know, the privilege of, of having a caretaker that maybe reads with you from a young age versus one that doesn't um, results in all sorts of different skill sets as we enter the education system. There's definitely a literacy gap. Um, it's been greatly exacerbated by COVID over the last three years, and it does correlate with socioeconomic racial discrepancies. Um, so when we have non-English exams, um, things like math, science, et cetera, that determine you know, advanced placement tracks or honors tracks, uh, we start to see that kind of trickle down effect about who gets what opportunities. Um, and and we, we might say, okay, honors track, yeah, why is that so important? It has been shown to correlate very strongly with post-secondary success, the kinds of college opportunities and then workforce opportunities, salary opportunities um, that students get. And again, there we see a very large racial discrepancy in, in the students that are recommended to take those kind of courses um, based on you know, teacher discernment of ability and, and the students that get those opportunities um, and eventually go on to achieve more post-secondary success. Um, and again, you know, through no fault of their own. So, so by reevaluating the traditional final, um, which we've already established is not doing what it's supposed to do, it's not effective at measuring content, it's not effective at measuring competency, we're actually promoting um, equitable education. We are addressing that DEI component um, and kind of reevaluating what systems work for who. Um, and so thanks to this PMP, uh, I was very eager to dive deeper and kind of look larger. And I'm actually currently doing research on what I've been talking to you all about, how uh, CBE or competency-based ed can inform the tangible implementation of diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI in districts. Um, so I'd like to just quickly highlight curricular differentiation. So CBE advocates for flexible curricular pacing, which is something that uh, Danelle and Annika got into a little bit. Um, flexible pacing, flexible content, et cetera, kind of pushing students to the extent of their own abilities, um, whatever that timeline may be. And this is extremely relevant um, in classrooms where we have those kinds of topics that DEI focuses on, you know, that conversation of how do we best address racism, prejudice, how do we talk about those things with our students come up? So ELA classrooms, history classrooms, social studies in general, right? And so recognizing that everybody um, has lived experience, that lived experience has academic valuable academic value, excuse me, and that everybody's kind of coming to the table with different amounts, different different levels of race consciousness, which is um, Dr. Deanna Blackwell's uh, terminology for, for this situation. And she's an absolutely incredible researcher. Um, Sidelines and Separate Spaces is definitely a paper worth perusing for those who are interested. Um, but kind of coming back to, to, to CBE, um, when, we, when we have these, these differences in, in, in backgrounds that are relevant to the topic being discussed, how do we go about navigating that? Well, well CBE tells us differentiation, right? They tell us to differentiate in, in the classroom. So what does this look like as it relates to, to conversations that, that include DEI topics? Well, that includes it involves including a whole range of, um, of materials for students. So on one end of the spectrum, right, we have perhaps racism awareness, that fundamental conversation of what is racism, what does prejudice look like, how is, how is it infiltrated our society, um, which is very relevant for students who might not have a whole lot of, you know, brushing up lived experience um, with the situation in real life. And on the other end of that spectrum, um, it involves a deep systemic dive into what does, what systems does racism permeate, um, what kind of psychological impacts um, do, do we see um, as a result of this history in this system? And what I've kind of experienced as a post-secondary student um, and, and kind of just through my research, what I've been seeing as well is a lot of, a lot of times right now, we just stop with that basic awareness discussion, um, which is not beneficial for all the students in the classroom. And so when we kind of talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, when we talk about incorporating diversity discussions, it's important, right, to make sure that those discussions challenge and benefit everybody um, and that they're not negligible for a group of students who maybe, who maybe this information is very obvious for. They don't need a basic awareness education. Um, and and whose students, um, who, their experiences may be relied upon to kind of further a point um, in the classroom, which creates this very unfortunate sort of power dynamic that we run up against. Um, so 
all of this is to say um, that just starting with this one, this one basic kind of paradigm that maybe we didn't think a whole lot about. I'm sure all of you guys have sat for very long, kind of exhausting finals and thought, whew, glad that's done, um, has blossomed into so much more. Um, and I kind of can't believe um, that I'm saying this, but I'm currently conducting case studies in three CBE schools um, and my own as well to kind of compare what equitable education looks like, the potential um, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion that CBE has. Um, so kind of exactly what Anik and Danell were saying. Um, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that this program and the interest that this program has opened up. Um, and I look forward to seeing where it's gonna take me in the future. Fantastic, thank you so much, Sabi. Um, yeah, so just to, you know, gotta do it again. Folks who, who answered yes to our, our question about final exams, um, please check out the publication. I just, I just threw that in the chat. Um, and also, I mean, we didn't ask a question about this, but I know, you know, a whole bunch of folks, uh, a big focus at, at the Aurora Institute in general is around equity, right? Um, that's one of the reasons a lot of us are drawn towards a, a competency-based approach. Um, so if that's something you're interested in as well, you know, uh, I think Sabi's project is, is really worth a read. Um, great, so uh, let's, let's keep going. Um, to all of our students, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your project and for, you know, really bringing your, your brilliant minds to, to this work. Um, yeah, and so I, I want to say, um, you know, from our end at Redesign, I want to point out the merits here of both process and product. So you've, you know, you've already heard from our students about the products that they have created through this project. Um, and I want to point out that the process itself of leading this exploration into educational paradigms and possibilities, um, we think at Redesign, it is also an unbelievable learning opportunity for, for young people everywhere. Um, in fact, at Redesign, we, we think that designing solutions um, in, in the way that this project kind of encourages young folks to do is one of kind of a number of essential competencies that the young people should be given opportunities to get better at. Um, this is a part of our whole child competency framework, which is something we've been working on for many years. Um, and specifically this, this Paradigms of Possibilities project, our students have been working on a key skill from that competency through it, um, uh, defining and exploring a design challenge, right? So you can see here, um, we've got a couple of the, the um, you know, specific level indicators um, that, that describe a lot of the things that you've heard from, from Donnell, from, from Sabi, from Monica. Um, and they've been working on this without even knowing it. Like this isn't, you know, the, the students can attest, right? Um, as we were practicing our presentation, I kind of sprung this on them. I was like, hey, actually you've been, you know, working on these things that we think are, are really essential for young people to learn. Um, and so the process itself is, is kind of my point here that um, the process of, of exploring educational paradigms and possibilities has real merit um, in terms of student growth and, and developing a skill that I think we could probably all agree here. seems seems more and more important in the modern world. Um, and so, you know, just to spell it out here, here's the big idea. Actually, we, you know, we have we have two big ideas from this first part. Um, and the first, I think, is hopefully the obvious one. Um, students are are brimming with ideas about how to solve the problems they see every single day. And um, they see them up close, directly in their own learning communities. And that means they, they can be incredible creative partners in addressing the paradigms that they just aren't working the way that you want them to in your learning communities. Um, and I think more importantly, by including them in the process, you can ensure that your solutions will be uh, learner centered. Remember, that's like what we're all about. And I think what, what a lot of folks are really working towards these days. Um, we, we want to create learner centered communities. And I think the best way to do that is to include learners in the, the design process, right? Um, and so secondly, um, and this kind of gets back to the, the process piece I just shared. Um, I think the process of leading an exploration into these paradigms, why they exist, how they can be better, um, it's it's just an incredible learning experience for anyone. I mean, anyone who has done this at any age knows how how um, hope inspiring, how perspective widening it can be. Um, it can be authentic, intrinsically motivated, um, and deeply contextualized. As uh, as I think Anika suggested, you know, for for helping students get a lay of the land, right? What's going on in education? What could school be like? Um, and it really focuses on a set of of core skills that you know at least we think are are really essential for young people to develop in the modern world if they're going to go out there and you know make make positive change which i think uh we we all want them to um yeah so that brings us to part two um so i'm, I'm gonna say thank you again to our students for, for sharing a little bit about their their projects um part two is gonna be a little bit shorter i want to take just a few minutes make sure we're doing all right on time um to talk a little bit about um how redesign has been engaging with some educational paradigms and trying to center student voice student perspectives in that process and hopefully this model for, um, again, centering student voice is something that, that folks can 
um, you know, internalize and, and take and adapt and, and use themselves. Because that's really the point here is we want students to be a part of, of the process. So, um, yeah, so right now, um, the uh, educational paradigm or, or kind of educational design challenge, um, one that we're really focused on at Redesign is, um, to put it bluntly, boring, rigid, passive curriculum. I'm sure anyone who's been an educator for long enough, and a lot of our students, you know, I, I see, uh, I see head, head nods, um, have, have run up against some form of curriculum that, that really kind of fits those unfortunate adjectives. Um, and so for the last few years, we have been kind of tinkering with ways to bring curriculum into, uh, into the modern age. That's how we like to say it. Um, and to us, you know, who better to inform our thinking on that than, you know, some bright and thoughtful humans who have grown up in that age, who are steeped in, in uh, the world as it, as it is and as it uh, is changing. Um, and so one of the solutions to this design challenge that we are working on is something we call explorations. So these are big collections of carefully curated resources that, that focus learning around a single compelling question. Um, they are kind of presented in a, in a very visual layout. And our, our goal is for them to be truly kind of exploratory. There's no start, no finish. Um, learners are kind of encouraged to build their own path of inquiry as they, you know, chew on really big questions that are, um, you know, I think, I think naturally at the heart of exploration. So um, these are designed so that as they go, you know, uh, folks have a chance to build background knowledge, build disciplinary knowledge, make connections to um, the world around them, as well as their own lived experiences and identities. And they're supported all the time with uh, scaffolding and kind of visual guidance. Um, and to get back to our students and how, uh, you know, they, they were involved in, in the design process of these explorations. Um, I think like any good inquiry-based learning experience, a lot of the impact of our explorations hinges on uh, a really crucial feature, which are the questions, right? We want them to be deep. We want them to be delicious. We want them to be provocative, you know? Um, and uh, I think like an exploration centered around the question of what should I have for lunch is probably not going to spark the kind of meaningful learning that we want um, young folks to, to engage in, right? Um, although I bet after a few of our presentations, some of y'all are thinking about lunch right now. I, I, uh, I'm not going not gonna, to not act like that's probably not true, but um, that's not the kind of exploration we want, want folks to be digging into, right? So um, we want questions that are going to spark interest, that are going to feel accessible, and I think most importantly lead to high quality learning. Um, and so to us, the only way to find those questions, to find the diamonds in the rough, right, are uh, to ask learners, you know, ask them for feedback. What, what is intriguing to you? What kind of, um, what questions would really do those things for you um, and are going to steer you away from thinking about your lunch? So what we did was conduct a pretty thorough and uh, kind of extensive piloting process of a whole bunch of questions that would form the basic infrastructure for our explorations. So we asked our students, our Youth Advisory Council students, to help us understand, you know, from their perspectives, how interesting, how accessible, how kind of like, I, I guess, high, high quality do the questions that we're posing um, feel to them, you know, because uh, these are questions that we want to then grow explorations out of. Um, and so we use a, a combination of surveys, of interviews, of feedback sessions, just to understand, you know, what students think about what makes a question compelling, what draws their interest, what feels like it would be worth digging into and learning about. Um, you know, one of our more clever ideas that I, I'd love to share with you all is, is uh, you know, in an effort to understand a little more about how students might navigate a, a really like truly exploratory, nonlinear, open set of questions. Um, we actually asked our students to record their computer screens as they explore their questions and resources. And we, um, you know, could see in real time, what are they clicking on? How long are they spending putting questions up on the screen? Um, which ones are they totally ignoring, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and again, the goal with all of these kind of, you know, weird ways of collecting data is, is to, to make what's going on in students' heads, in their, um, in their bodies, what, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, um, accessible to us. Because that information, I think, has to be at the heart of designing any kind of solution to any kind of educational design challenge, right? Um, and so I think what we learned from this process has, has really become a fundamental part of how we design these explorations now. You know, the questions we organize new boards around, the resources we anchor learning in, the types of inquiry that we want to encourage, um, and even, I think, how we see explorations fitting into, into classrooms, into the, the kind of traditional classroom experience. So we've taken all this student input, like literally pages and pages of it, um, as, as our students know. Um, and we spent a couple of months uh, synthesizing, figuring out what it means for the next iteration of our, of our explorations. Um, and so y'all have heard me say exploration, that that word has lost its meaning to me now um, so many times in the last few minutes, right? I'm sure you're wondering, like, what, what on earth is this person talking about? Um, so I'd love to show you just quickly one of our newer prototypes. Um, that has really emerged from this student feedback. 
um, that would not exist the way it does, I think, without our students' perspectives and their really thoughtful ideas. Um, so I'm going to share a link in the chat if you'd like to open this up uh, alongside me. Um, this is uh, this this exploration board is um, available on Miro, which is a kind of online collaborative platform. If you ever use that, uh, you don't need uh, you shouldn't need an account or anything like that to see this. Um, although if you do, you know, please please uh, send me a message later or contact me by email. I'll be happy to share it with you. Um, but I'm also going to share my screen and show y'all what the Miro boards look like. So hopefully you can see here. Let me zoom out. Um, so this is it. This is what I've been talking about. This is an exploration board. This is kind of our one of our prototypes that, um, again, was really informed by our student feedback. So you can see, I'm going to zoom in and show you this central question, right? How can we create livable communities? This is one of the things that our students spend a whole bunch of time giving us really thoughtful and meaningful feedback about, you know, what is going to grab my interest? And not interest in, you know, a sensationalist way, not like a, a shiny toy, but what is going to grab people's um, attention make a question feel relevant to them that they would actually want to lead inquiry around, right? Um, and then obviously around this question is you have a whole bunch of other questions with the different themes, different focuses. Um, and these questions as well are, are, you know, very strongly based on what our students have told us about. Um, understanding their own communities is a big thing that a lot of students mentioned, right? So we have questions around um, what the parts of a, of a community, livable community are, you know, local. Um, it's relation to government policy, right? the relationship between livability and physical health. Um, the, the questions that we use, the way we phrase them, all these things I think are, are really, um, again, as I've said, have kind of grown out of the feedback that our, our, students, um, our students gave us. Um, and generally, you know, this, this, these exploration boards, they're organized so that students can, can you know, be self-directed and explore a new topic. Every one of these tiles, I'll just zoom in all the way, right? It's got a big question that it focuses on that fits underneath our, our big um, compelling question. And has, you know, it's got scaffolding guidance text. It has a whole bunch of resources that give students multiple perspectives on this topic. Um, and they can, you know, look at the ones they want, they look at, look at the ones that, that interest them and pass over the ones that don't seem relevant to them in the moment. And um, that's kind of the, the, the goal of a, a really, you know, a truly exploratory learning experience. Um, so I think the, the, Next kind of thing to do, you've heard me talk a little bit about this process and, and you've seen where we took it. Um, I would love to give our students a few minutes to talk briefly about their experience. You know, it's one thing for me to say that the students had a great time and gave us all this feedback, but um, you know, it's I think more meaningful for everyone to hear from the students themselves. That's why y'all are probably here is to hear from them. So um, yeah, for, for our students, I have a couple questions for you if you, if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing with, with the folks here. Um, I think the first one is just about this design problem that I talked about, right? Um, that redesign is kind of identified rigid, boring, passive curriculum. Um, as I said, I saw a lot of nods as I'm, I was saying that phrase, right? Um, so what do you think? What do you think about this design problem? Is this, is this a real problem? Uh, where have you seen it in your own kind of education? And what do you think about explorations as like a, a you know, a starting point for, for resolving that, that issue, that paradigm? Um, I think this is definitely a real problem. Um, I've experienced how linear teaching and passive curriculum really might be the best way to get information in students' faces, but it's not the best way to help them internalize it. Um, I've seen I've seen it pretty much every class, every year of my education. I feel like I've pulled out a notebook a million times to take notes off a slideshow. Um, and I think the exploration boards are a fantastic part of the solution because in my experience with them, it's felt a lot more open to exploring as the name suggests, um, like giving the students a buffet of information and letting them dive into the subjects and the questions and even like the sub subjects and the, the little things they're, they're the most interested in. And that will help them really learn the material and internalize it and um, I think exploration boards, yeah, are definitely a good part of the solution. Right on. Thank you, Donnell. I just um, want to one I, second. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Actually, because you just sparked an idea, Donnell. Um, really briefly, I mean, exactly what I was kind of saying at the end of my presentation, I'm providing a range of resources, right, from 101 and exposure all the way to systemic approach. That's the exploration board. I mean, this is the tool that does mm -hmm. it right for you so that teachers don't kind of have to compile this on their own. Um, so this is an awesome way to approach individualization in the classroom kind of from a CDE perspective as we talk about DEI topics. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, right on. I see. A, I see an expiration board in your in your near future, Sabi. Maybe. Um, very cool. Um, I guess the, the next question, and, and uh, you know, again, tending to process and product. Um, what was the kind of review feedback process like? Can you tell folks a little bit about that? Um, I know it was a while ago. So for for context, folks, we we were doing this process um, uh, quite a few months ago. I'd say like five or six months ago. Does that sound about right, folks? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, it's like we got so much feedback that it literally took us months to kind of sift through it all. So much good stuff too. Um, but anyways, what did it feel like to to give your feedback on these boards on the questions? Um, can anyone anyone speak to that? Um, in all honesty, it started out a little awkward. It was it took a little bit getting used to to be like talking to a screen as I was being recorded. But I really liked how I could see like a bird's eye view of the um, of, of the boards and then talk about the things that I noticed as I was noticing them. Um, I I liked how I could go through and as I was reading them, I could say, yeah, this doesn't make that much sense. Or, oh, I love this part. It makes so much sense. Um, and giving feedback on the boards, I think it helped me feel important and valued, especially when I knew the redesign crew would be watching my videos all the way through and wanting, um, wanting to hear what I had to say about the things that I noticed about the exploration board and, um, my work in youth advisory council and giving feedback on the boards. It has been a great experience because I feel like I'm respected and trusted for my responsibility and I can share my opinion and it'll fall on listening ears. Wow, awesome. Um, thanks, Donnell, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I guess then if folks, if, if you wanna jump in there, feel free to otherwise. Um, okay, I, I guess my last question for you then is, uh like is this it is this the way maybe not the only way right but is this a good way of involving students in designing curriculum is that important um what do y'all think like why or or why not uh i i definitely agree like i think that this is definitely an important part of the solution um obviously i'm a little bit biased as a student myself but i do think that many students have spent a lot of time thinking and reflecting on our education system and have a lot to contribute to the conversation on how we can make it even better. Um, I also kind of like I touched on before, strongly believe that involving students in their own education process, giving them autonomy, just makes them take more initiative in their own learning and be more engaged in their education. When students feel like they're being listened to and respected by educators, they feel like they're being heard, I think it significantly improves the relationships between those two groups of people, which in a lot of cases isn't always very positive. I think improving that relationship is a big step towards improving education as a whole. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thanks, Annika. Um, and for the folks listening, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm sure so many of y'all have um, recognized the importance of, of you know, educator-student relationships. That's something that um, I think comes up often at at uh, at the symposium um, every year. So it's it's I think great to hear from students about how uh, how they see that and and what what pathways they see for for strengthening that within within learning communities. Um, and so you know uh, the the point here I think in this this is our kind of final part of our our session today is not that we fixed exploration boards and that now they're perfect. Um, oops. In fact, here we go. Um, in fact, it's not really about exploration boards at all. Um, what we're trying to get at here, I think, is the power of involving students directly and meaningfully in your process as you design solutions to, to the educational paradigms that you are, are kind of investigating in your own school community. You know, um, I was talking about those pages and pages of feedback. There are so many perspectives and ideas in there that we never would have been able to guess at as a bunch of adults sitting at home, you know, thinking about what young people want and need. Um, well, well meaning, right? But to be honest, you, you just don't need to do that. You can just ask them. Um, as I've said, I, I'm, I'm certain that a lot of the, the, the students that most of y'all work with um, are, are bring, brimming with ideas, brimming with, with kind of intrinsically motivated interest in, in helping to solve these problems. Um, and I think more importantly than the fact that you can ask them is, is that you should ask them. That's kind of really what we, we um, you know, want to convey here. And I think why a lot of, you know, 
you folks, I, I would imagine, have joined this session today is because you, you are, are interested in that or, or kind of believe that we should be asking students how to reimagine education for, for the world that they, they are coming into. You know, if we want to bring these paradigms and these structures into this future um, so that they actually meet the needs of all students and again, you know, turn schools into learner-centered communities, that's, that's always our goal. Um, we think that process has to happen with students. There's no way around it. I mean, it can take lots of different forms. You don't all have to do a, you know, crazy screen recording, mouse tracking uh, kind of research project, right? Um, you know, part of what's tricky is finding the right form of, of centering students for your own learning community. Um, but it has to be there somehow. I think that's, that's a really essential principle. Um, yeah, and so that's it. We've, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, I am going to just notify folks we are going to have in the chat. Let me make sure if, uh, yeah. Um, so we're going to throw in the chat. There's going to be a survey from our, our wonderful folks at Aurora. Um, it's really brief, um, and I, I really want to ask folks to, to fill this out. It's very helpful for us, very helpful for the Aurora Institute. Um, you know, that's how we're able to make these conferences better and better each year. Um, so please fill out this, this survey that uh, those folks are going to put in the chat. Um, and the second thing, you know, a little little gift for the road, as I've put it, um, is a link to Redesign's Rigor Toolbox. So this is a collection of the most kind of useful and transformative tools that, that we have, um, that we have ever really created for, for transforming learning. Um, and it's completely free. It is open for you to use, to adapt, to go have a party with. Um, and you'll recognize a few of the tools in there from our session today, the, the whole child competency framework that I talked about earlier. Um, our prototype exploration board that, that y'all just looked at on Miro, um, those are all in there. So if you were intrigued by any of those and you want to learn more about them, um, please check out the Rigor Toolbox on, on our website. Um, I'm going to put a, a link to the chat or a link in the chat here to, to that as well. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you have follow-up questions, you have um, you know, anything else you're interested in chatting with us at Redesign about or any of our students on the Youth Advisory Council about, um, please feel free to contact me. I'm going to put my email address in the, uh, in the chat. Um, please, yeah, get in touch. We'd love to, love to work with you, learn from you, um, and, you know, uh, get, you, get you connected with our, with our students who I think are, are really where most of the, the incredible learning happens. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just so I can see everybody. I know we're running yeah. very low on time, but I did notice yeah. in the chat, um, it was a really great question and it came up a couple of times. So um, I think it was uh, John's yeah. question about how we've kind of applied this to our local context, which is something that I'm really enthusiastic about. Um, Thanks, Abby, go for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure Danelle and Annika have some thoughts on this as well. Um, uh, so for me, um, where I went with kind of the, the curriculum building knowledge that I gained from redesign um, was I put it in application. So there's a lot of local uh, kind of after school programs that lack structure where I lived. Um, a lot were underfunded, a lot lacked um, just volunteers um, to come in. So right now, um, kind of with a group of friends, I had ended up founding um, a education non for profit and what we do is we create social justice and competency based curriculum. Um, we, we have a, a team of 150 student volunteers from across the state, which is crazy to say and it's kind of been the product of definitely Rohan's help um, in terms of uh, I was given the task of okay, uh, we see the issue um, after school programs don't have structure. Um, my peers are lacking in empathy and the desire to respectfully communicate kind of after the events of the last decade. Um, there's not really an interest in finding that common ground, that common bridge um, and doing anything but yelling at each other. So now what do we do about it? Um, so I've been kind of taking uh, these notions of how best to bring diversity into the classroom, what competency-based ed looks like and designing curriculum that's being implemented in local school districts, um, local after school programs where I am. So that's kind of that real world impact and how it ties in, um, but passing it off to kind of my fellow students. Um, I'm actually going to jump in. I think folks do need to, to leave. We've got another presentation starting. So thank you, Sabi. I, I really appreciate you, you getting to that question as, as I uh, prefaced. I did not see that question in the chat. Um, so yeah, thanks, folks. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. Please get in touch if you're interested in, in, uh, in working with us, partnering with us, um, and hearing from our students, of course.